Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this episode of the Referology series uh, where, we, where we'll be talking about uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Dr. Amanda Lim, who's an endocrinologist. And for the scope of today's discussion, we'll be focusing more on the uh, diagnosis of diabetes, the initial uh, workup and evaluation, as well as um, some matters surrounding the initial uh, treatment of diabetes. Uh, we'll not be covering uh, diabetic crisis and so much of uh, inpatient management uh, in this uh, episode. Okay, so uh, Dr. Amanda, maybe we can start off by talking about how we go about uh, diagnosing diabetes. I think most of us have an idea, but perhaps um, we could dive into certain specifics uh, and also talk about where HbA1c fits into the, this um, diagnostic uh, aspect of things. All right, yeah. So um, I think in Singapore, we still uh, follow the MOHCPG. This was the latest one back in 2014. Of course, there are certain updates by the uh, ACE and, and other guidance. So I mean, based on this, um, if the patient has any uh, hyperglycemia or any other metabolic complications, for example, DKA or HHS, um, and together with the, uh, the blood glucose, so if the fasting glucose is more than 7 or the random glucose is more than 11.1 or 2-hour glucose is more than 11.1, and with the typical symptoms, then you can actually diagnose uh, diabetes in the, in initially. Um, and then if there, is, if there isn't any typical symptoms, then you have to repeat it again um, and, and to see. So um, I'm going on to the next slide. Um, if the blood sugar is in between, so say uh, more than um, 6.0, but the two-hour OGTT is, is um, less than 7.8, then you consider this impaired fasting glucose. Um, if the... If the if the two-hour um, OGCT is between 7.8 to 11.0, then this would be considered impaired uh, glucose tolerance. Of course, someone can actually have concomitant impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. Um, and if the two-hour post uh, glucose challenge is more than 11.1, then we consider this DM. So back to your question into why uh, where this HPA1C came from is because um, ADA and WHO had this uh, further guidance a few years ago. Um, where they actually recommended a cutoff of 6.5 uh, for the screening and diagnosis of, of diabetes. Um, together with this, I think if you look at the, the small little side point here, it says in the absence of unequivocal hyperglycemia, diagnosis requires two abnormal test results from the sample or two separate samples. So you actually need to also use it in combination whether this patient has typical symptoms or not. I see. Okay. So um, perhaps let's say, because a lot of these patients, as in a lot of patients who come in who have a renal panel done, and oftentimes it is paired with a glucose. Uh, and oftentimes, I guess, um, we either go about screening for diabetes because of age-appropriate screening, or we incidentally notice that the glucose um, is high, right? So I guess, number one, what counts as unequivocal uh, hyperglycemia? Is it a, a numerical cutoff from the random glucose point of view? Yeah, uh, I think you can use a random glucose of, of more than 11.1 okay. uh, or, or in terms of typical symptoms as well. So typical symptoms would be like uh, polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss from hyperglycemia. Okay, so in the absence of the typical symptoms, but let's say the random glucose is, for example, like 14, um, and let's say the HbA1c is um, more than 6.5, um, will we still need a second reading? Uh, of another test, or does that count as uh, diabetes already? Okay, so it, it really depends on the setting on how this random glucose was done. Was, it, was there any other interfering medications, or was this patient unwell? Was I there see. any stress, hyperglycemia, or was this patient on steroids, for example? Mm. Uh, so these different factors will, will affect um, how you interpret the, the random glucose at a point of time. I see. Um, if, let's say, it's a purely outpatient basis and the HbA1c is, is 6.5 and the, and the random glucose is 11, it seems a bit discordant um, okay. for, for that level of HbA1c. So I'll actually do a formal uh, uh, two-hour GTT with a zero-minute fasting and a two-hour post-glucose uh, test. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of HbA1c in, in the Singaporean context, um, uh, how, how, how do things stand right now? Because you mentioned that this came initially from the ADA side of things. So how validated is this in the more local community? That's right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, in ADA um, and the studies, we cannot completely uh, um, adopt it over here. So, I think um, our group did a, a study as well among the different races in Singapore um, to test, you know, the performance of HbA1c as a as a screening test for diabetes. Yep. Um, so, I think what they found was, I mean, going to the next slide. Uh, 
if you received, I think all of us received this yep. in our email last year, uh, which recommended a new screening test after a review committee. Yep. And what they recommended is, uh, so we don't use a cutoff of 6.5, mm. but rather ours is slightly more complicated. Okay. Um, where if it's less than 6.0% for the fe one c then there'll be a low probability of diabetes. Mm. Um, if it's more than 7% and above, then there'll be a high prob probability of diabetes. So they okay. did this uh, work in, with, uh, with the, with the lab net and the, the division of endocrinology to look at, at, at the cutoffs. Now. Okay. Um, I think the part that some people have a bit of uh, confusion about is because 7.0 then says high probability of diabetes and it says that no further tests are needed. So in this context of above 7, I mean, so it suggests that if it's above 7, then you just move on to diabetes uh, management uh, as appropriate. So this part here, how do we go about interpreting it? Uh? Okay. So, um, because for most patients, uh, we aim for HPA1C target of less than 7% anyway. Yep. Um, and so, if the A1C target, if it, I mean, the, if the existing A1C is already more than 7%, it would be almost as if you're treating for diabetes anyway yep. without doing any further tests. Got it. Um, so, that's why uh, if it's more than 7%, you actually still treat for diabetes anyway. I see, um, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I also understand that the, uh, this set of guidelines did mention certain caveats uh, with regard to HbA1c. Um, maybe you could just take us through what are some of the important things to take note of when we are looking at HbA1c as a sole reading. Yeah, uh, so I, I think what, what differentiates us from, from, let's say, America or other countries is actually the high prevalence of hemoglobinopathies. Okay. So thalassemia, hemoglobin variants, and um, so this can actually increase and also decrease uh, the effect on HbA1c. Um, there are other, other uh, factors like iron deficiency, which actually prolong um, the RBC lifespan. So A1C is increased. But of course, if there's blood loss, then on the other hand, you actually have a, um, a decrease in A1C. And also, if you, you know, some patients get a transfusion, then that would cause a decrease in the HPA1C. Yeah. Okay. In terms of um, chronic uh, uh, renal uh, failure, I think we have a lot of patients who, who are in this category. Actually, the A1C can be falsely increased or decreased uh, depending on, on a lot of different factors because patients with CKD are also at risk of you know, iron deficiency, um, blood loss, uh, and also they also have use of erythropoietin. So there are many different factors for patients with CKD. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, you yeah. also included this slide about prediabetes. <laughs> yeah. I did, I did. Because um, the, the, one of the reasons for, for uh, the HbA1c cutoff between 6.1 to 6.9, which is the in-between, is actually also to, to highlight the importance of, of managing prediabetes as well. So, um, uh, because in, in prediabetes, uh, there are actually things that we can do as um, healthcare providers in primary care or even in, in tertiary care uh, to, to encourage our patients to have a I mean, certain lifestyle intervention through a healthy diet, physical activity, and also in certain patients to consider the use of metformin as well for management of pre-diabetes without waiting for patients to progress to, to full-blown diabetes. I see. Okay. Um, so for those patients would be patients who have a more like metabolic syndrome phenotype uh, kind of um, situation. That's when you would often consider metformin upfront rather than waiting for the HB1C to rise further? Uh, yeah. So I, okay. I would, if, especially if they are overweight um, and if let's say they try lifestyle intervention or they don't achieve very much uh, weight loss in lifestyle intervention, then actually I would start some metformin already. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Amanda. Okay, so the next question is about uh, type 1 diabetes. So what are the indications for evaluating for type 1 DM and what are the tests that we should be sending off for? All right, uh, I think type 1 diabetes is, is really tricky to manage. Um, I think, you know, we all know that type 1 diabetes is due to, to the autoimmune um, destruction of the beta cells and this leads to absolute insulin deficiency. Um, but there's a considerable overlap between type 1 and type 2 in terms of clinical presentation. Yep. But the disease progression can be also very different. Um, so, you know, it's not very clear at, at the point of diagnosis of diabetes, what type of, of uh, diabetes this particular patient has. Yep. So, you know, type 1 can present in adulthood and type 2, increasingly, we see more in children. Mm. Um, type 2s, especially, you know, in hospital, we see a lot of patients with type 2 but have DKA. Yep. And we also see a lot of patients with type 1 who are actually more overweight as well. So it's, it's very difficult to tell. Um, and only the true diagnosis, whether this patient has an absolute insulin deficiency, will only become more obvious as, as time goes on, as you follow, follow this patient up longitudinally. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. Even, yeah. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so I think when I would really suspect type 1 first is, is whether is there any other evidence of autoimmunity. Um, for example, if let's say they have obvious vitiligo, already have, all, already have um, some kind of thyroid autoimmune disease, uh, if they have recurrent DKAs, so that, you know, whether after they stop insulin for uh, even or one or two days, uh, for some reason, if they have uh, omission of insulin for any reason and they, they go into a DKA, then that will also suggest that this patient has an insulin deficiency. And um, I'll also look whether this patient has, looks like he has other types of, of diabetes, for example, any evidence of insulin resistance. So central obesity, uh, the uh, acanthosis nigricans, um, uh, that we suggest maybe a more type 2 phenotype. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of the tests that we, if let's say we are suspecting type 1 DM, what should we be sending off for? Yeah. So, um, um, I mean, in addition to, to the HbA1c, I'll, I'll also send off the antibodies, um, yep. the GET antibodies and the islet cell antibodies, and I'll um, also assess a, a, a random C peptide as well. I think okay. of note, um, uh, in, in Singapore, I think Prof. Leon Singh actually did a, a study with, with uh, uh, a few, quite, quite long ago, um, but it's the prevalence of, of the GAT and ICA antibodies at the initial presentation of type 1 DM in Singaporean children. So the, just the, the prevalence of antibodies is actually quite low compared to, to the Caucasian population. So it's only about 41.5%. So okay. that means even if the antibodies is negative, it doesn't exclude the diagnosis of, of type 1, although having it positive will be very helpful, of course. Understand. In terms of the C peptide, um, do we send it off uh, only when they are, let, let's say, well in an outpatient setting, or you know, because some of the patients may either come in with um, crisis or let's say very poorly controlled glycemic uh, status at that point in time? Um, would the C peptide be affected by by these factors, and do we need to time when we check the C peptide? Uh, yes. So um, I would say that uh, during a acute illness or a diabetic crisis. Um, like a TKA or even severe hyperglycemia, mm. um, the glucotoxicity can affect the, the CPAP level or the endogenous insulin production. So okay. I would do it when, when the patient is, is well. So I'll do it okay. outpatient usually. Yeah. Understand. Thank you very much, Dr. Amanda. Okay, so the next question um, kind of is a lead in from what we have just discussed, but more a bit about special uh, subtypes uh, of diabetes. I think this is probably more into um, specialist based uh, uh, realms, but I think um, because uh, oftentimes many of the patients with diabetes, of which some of these subsets may also be roaming in the general population, um, yeah, I just wanted to have a quick discussion on some of the special subtypes. When should we be suspecting them? And um, yeah, i.e. when, let's say, it's important to, to get endocrine on board. Okay, I think first up, I think when should we refer, if there's any signs of atypical diabetes, then it probably should, should refer already. Lah. And okay. it doesn't mean that, you know, we'll see, we'll keep the patient forever, we'll probably see assess, and we may still uh, discharge back to, to the primary care providers or the primary physician. Yep. So that's to, to answer the last question first. Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so moving on to, to Modi. Uh, yeah maturity onset of uh, diabetes of the young. So this is a very interesting group of patients with diabetes where, where they actually have hyperglycemia at, a, at a quite a young age. Um, and the pattern of inheritance is usually autosomal dominant. Yep. And usually this is, is due to the impaired insulin secretion rather than things like insulin action or insulin resistance, for example. Mm. So um, when you suspect someone with Modi would be someone with, with uh, diabetes without, you know, doesn't look like a type 1 or doesn't look like a type 2. Okay. Um, the, the patient you know, doesn't have positive autoantibodies, doesn't have other features of, of, of metabolic syndrome. Um, the patient may be quite lean um, and usually there's a strong family history of, of diabetes as well, like an autosomal pattern with a, with a young, young onset. So okay. there are different types of modi, uh, it's just a blanket term, but there are many different subtypes um, of which I think the next page has the top three most common yep. ones. Yeah. So the most, the, these I think the three most common ones. Um, uh, GCK Modi is, is usually picked up during screening, for example, during gestational diabetes or even during NS uh, times. Okay. Uh, the special feature about this is that there's actually stable, um, mild uh, fasting hyperglycemia, but the two hour post uh, uh, glucose load is typically uh, normal or very, very mild. So okay. um, this is because GCK is, is 
is part of is a rate limiting step for the glucose phosphorylation, which is the glucose sensing pathway for the beta cells to respond. Hmm. So it's it's almost like that they have a higher set point. Okay. Um, but once they have, they have, there's a glucose load on meal or two hour glucose, actually it responds appropriately. So these patients actually do not typically require any treatment, um, okay. but there are implications in pregnancy because if the mother is GCK uh, positive and the fetus is GCK positive, actually the, the, the mother doesn't need to be to be treated for for, um, for her for her gestational okay. diabetes or, or hypoglycemia. Okay. Uh, okay. Things have become more complicated when the when the fetus um, you know, doesn't have a, a GCK positive, or if let's say the, the fetus is GCK positive and the mother is is uh, doesn't does um doesn't have her enemies inherited from the from the father. So that it becomes a little bit more tricky. Mm. I see. Yeah. Okay. So basically in summary then this would be young young patients who present um with diabetes, but at the same time they don't really fit a, a type one picture per se because they are not insulin uh, deficient and they don't have antibody positivity. And in those subsets then you might be suspecting um Modi, is that correct? And I guess a family history component too. Yes, yes. Um so okay. not typically type one, not typically type two. Um in general they are quite lean. Okay. Um, and the G different modis have different features. So the GCK, which I've mentioned, the very mild fasting hyperglycemia, but yep. postprandial is usually normal. On the other okay. hand, the other two in this list, um, the HNF ones, um, usually these ones have a larger glucose excursion um, after a meal or after the two-hour glucose. Um, and the interesting thing about, about these two modis are that, that they can be treated with sulfonylureas. They're actually very sensitive to sulfonylureas. Okay, so these patients often will end up getting some form of genetic testing to clinch the diagnosis? Well, very often, I think we, we probably underdiagnose them a lot. Okay. <laughs> I think a lot of people, uh, especially maybe the HNF uh, modis are, are missed. Patients with HNF uh, type, kind of modi will, will be diagnosed um, as type 1 or type 2. Okay. Um, so there are uh, research studies that, that you know, we can recruit to send them for genetic testing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Amanda. Okay, so then next would be about uh, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. Okay, um, so uh, LADA as well is, I would consider this simply put as, as a type 1 diabetes. Um, okay. It is actually uh, autoimmune um, destruction of, of the beta cells again. Yep. So it's very similar to, to a type 1. I think the special features of this is that um, it's a progressive loss of control with oral agents. So these patients may be diagnosed with type 2 first mm -hmm. and then uh, they can be treated maybe quite well with, 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 with uh, oral agents initially. Um, okay. They may not even require insulin for more than six months, for example, but uh, as, as, her, as, the degree, as the disease progresses, they'll become progressively dependent on insulin and they, they, they also get recurrent uh, DKAs um, and the antibodies uh, if the antibody is positive, that will also help with the diagnosis as well. I see. So for these patients, because oftentimes they get diagnosed as like type 2, are there any um, instances where upfront you would be suspecting LADA and that you may want to pursue um, also antibody testing, even in the context of a seemingly uh, phenotypically type 2 DM picture? Um, I would say it's very hard to tell. Okay. Um, yeah. Unless so, they, they present with a DKA, um, okay. then I'll be a bit more cautious in, in terms of, I mean, I'll, if, if they are type 2 with a new DKA, and then um, I would check the antibodies and also be more cautious about tapering or discontinuing insulin completely. I see. For these patients. Yeah. Okay, so practically speaking, it would be someone who, who either develops DKA or someone who, let's say, was previously type 2 DM, but seemed to be now... Um, becoming insulin dependent in a fairly young age. And it seems like why is a type 2 picture becoming a type 1 so quickly? And in those instances, you would be concerned about possible ladder. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I okay. Would say that. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I think there are also some other rarer and more unusual types of diabetes that um, you could share with us about. Yeah. I guess this, this was just, uh, just to, to make people aware that there's, there's unusual kinds of diabetes as well. Um, so mitochondrial diabetes, uh, it would, be, it would be something um, like atypical diabetes as well. So not type 1, not type 2, also not moody. <laughs> okay. um, things that you, you would watch out for is things like a maternal inheritance because mitochondria um, 
is inherited from is methylene, methylene inherited. So these two syndromes like uh, NILAS, uh, mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, like the acidosis stroke like uh, episodes, and MIDD, uh, maternally inherited diabetes and, and deafness. Um, and I've honestly not, not seen any of these before, but I know my colleagues have, have seen. Um, so I think it's, it's good to, to have a high index of suspicion, suspicion especially if, if you see patients with, with uh, unusual neurological problems with like acidosis and, and diabetes as well. Okay. And then I think the, the uh, one key point in addition to this is that um, you, may, you would not want to use metformin in these patients because of the risk of like acidosis. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so next we'll move on, we'll shift gears a bit to talk about uh, treatment initiation. Um, so maybe you could take us through firstly what are the principles guiding the initiation of uh, DM treatment and um, I think we'll focus probably a little bit more on the type 2 DMs. Um, so number one, how do you decide which um, oral agents to start and when and how would you go about uh, starting insulin? So I guess this is quite a lot to cover. <laughs> it is, it yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I, I guess we won't talk much about type 1 yep. but I think we just wanted to highlight in type 1 diabetes uh, uh, very importantly, is the diabetes education and support. Okay. Um, and, and I think that that's, it's really helpful to have a multidisciplinary clinic or team uh, yep. with the uh, uh, diabetes nurses, the dietitians, uh, um, the, the physician, and maybe even sometimes the psychologist or social worker to help in, in supporting the type 1 patients. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll go on to type 2. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Sounds All great. Right. All right, so type two, um, again, uh, diabetes education and support, uh, lifestyle modification as well with terms of diet, exercise, and weight loss. Um, I think metformin has, has always been um, the first line, and I think it probably will still be the first line for a long time to come. Yep. Um, in terms of the second line agents, uh, after metformin, there's a lot of different factors, and different uh, health organizations around the world will also have different recommendations, also to fit their different practices and in different countries. But in general, um, the few factors that we consider would be, would be these uh, factors. So yep. things like the degree of hyperglycemia, how bad is the diabetes at present? Are there any um, hyperglycemic symptoms? Um, how long has this patient had uh, diabetes for? Um, do we know any of the beta cell reserve? Are there any, does the patient have any other comorbidities like uh, cardiovascular or CKD or heart failure? Okay. Um, in addition, with regards to the medication itself, things like the uh, glucose lowering effect of each drug, are there any other benefits other than the glucose lowering effect? So are there other benefits for say, cardiovascular or renal? We'll also consider that. In terms of the side effect profile, um, in particular, we'll look at the risk of hypoglycemia and also the effect on, on, on weight because things like uh, sulfonyl ureas and insulin tend to cause weight gain, whereas um, most of our patients with type 2 are already overweight. So it may not be that favorable. We want to choose a more weight neutral or even a weight loss um, a medication for, uh, if, if possible. Okay. Um, but of course, the last things would be things like cost, uh, which is a huge uh, factor in, 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 our, in how we practice um, and the choice of, of, of whatever agents we choose. Yep. And also preference in terms of orals or injectables and the availability of which our, 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 where we practice our healthcare institution uh, has this medication or not. Okay, understand. Thanks so much for that overview. Maybe before we move on to um, the specific medications and a bit about insulin, can I find out, let's say, about the lifestyle modification bit? Um, what are, because I mean, I mean, we all know that um, diet, exercise, and weight loss is uh, important in the management of uh, type 2 DM in particular, but um, are there but I guess sometimes we struggle with telling patients um, what exactly to, to say. So do you have like a spew or something that you normally tell patients uh, when you come? So I mean, of course, you get a dietitian and all that on board. But in terms of like general things that you tell them, um, how does your initial counseling look like? Okay. So I think in terms of any weight loss target, um, I would say at least 5%. It doesn't okay. seem too much of a, it's not, it's not too daunting for a lot of patients. And when they calculate the, the weight loss of 5%, they, they, most of them feel that it's, it's doable. Okay. Um, but I think it, but the more the better, of course. Yep. So if you can wait, aim for 7% or, or 10%, um, then that, that would be even better. Okay. Uh, in terms of the exercise, bit, um, so I also tell them the benefits of exercise, that even if they don't lose weight or the diabetes doesn't get better, there are still other um, things like fitness, cardiovascular yep. benefit, uh, quality of life, improvement in mood. Um, that, that occurs when, when people like regularly engage in exercise. Okay. So I tell them to, to start 
slow <laughs> and start yeah. small. Uh, small okay. goals. Yeah. And the diet wise, do you normally focus on like let's say things to avoid or um how how do you go about like constructing that conversation with them usually? Yeah, I think dietary advice is really difficult because people have that you know, um they grew up and, and with life lifestyle habits and also not things that they can normally yep. control. Yeah. Things that are in around the environment or at home or their workplace. So I think yes. diet it really has to be individualized. Yeah. Um, uh, we do use some meal replacements, so things like like glucina or the fast for that. Uh, okay. But there's this issue of, of uh, the taste and the cost of it as well. Mm. Um, in general, I'll I'll try to tell them one of the one of the options is actually to just reduce portion size. Okay. Um, another another tactic I tell them is to completely avoid um simple carbohydrates, things like sugar. Okay. Um, and another general rule I, I increasingly tell my patients is to avoid uh, processed food as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, yeah, so maybe we could talk a bit about uh introduction of insulin. I think uh in general, um, non endocrinologists are always like okay like, wait until uh more severe than start insulin. Uh, but I understand that yeah that there 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 is suggestion that there might be benefit in starting insulin early in certain instances. So maybe you could just highlight some of uh these indications. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, when I would I would start early insulin would be of course if there's already severe hyperglycemia. Um, if they're in hospital for a diabetic uh, emergency like DKA or HHS, then I'll, I'll definitely start insulin early. Yep. Um, if let's say they're outpatient, um, so things that I'll, I, I would start insulin early would be like polyuria, polydipsia, mm -hmm. there's ongoing weight loss, um, and also the degree of hyperglycemia as well. So if, if the A1C is more than 10%, it's really hard to bring it down with, with orals, although it's, it is possible, um, or the blood sugar is, is persistently more than 15, 16, for example. Um, another reason for this to initiate insulin early is that after the glucose toxicity resolves, um, actually you can reduce the insulin regimen to maybe even orals is also possible. Yeah. Okay. So I guess when we counsel patients and let's say for type 2s in these instances when we are starting insulin, um, sometimes if let's say we can get things under control, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would be on insulin for life kind of thing, la, depending on how the control goes and um, whether or not we can uh, subsequently gain control uh, with a suitable oral regimen. Is that correct? Yes, and together with, with the lifestyle changes and weight loss. Okay. So um, sometimes if they say they come in with severe symptomatic hyperglycemia hmm. and it's a type 2, um, we start insulin initially, but if um, with, with weight loss, uh, lifestyle changes and initiation of, of other oral agents, let's say metformin as a start, um, then we can actually quite, for some patients, we can rapidly cut down the insulin and we can maybe change from basal bolus to just a basal regimen. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think the ne next slide talks about uh, the, um, the sort of approach to determining um, the choice of different agents. Um, I thought it's probably worthwhile talking about some of the oral agents given that um, there have been some newer agents like your SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 uh, receptor antagonists in recent um, agony, sorry, in recent times. Um, and I think maybe um, some of the uh, non-endocrinologists or non-medical people may be not so familiar with uh, some of uh, these agents. Um, so maybe you could highlight some of the uh, important things in this slightly uh, busy <laughs> uh, slide that we, yeah, that we have here. Yeah, so this is the latest algorithm by ADA. Actually, I mean, algorithms change <laughs> almost every year, right? So yep. it just gets more confusing. I think just going through step by step, starting from the top. Um, firstly, I mean metformin is the first line to build together with yep. lifestyle change, uh, weight management, and physical activity. So then the next line of uh, for this algorithm now becomes um, the comorbidities. So does this patient have uh, cardiovascular disease, CKD, or heart failure? Yeah. Um, it's because of yes, as you mentioned in the last few years, there are more uh, cardiovascular or, or, or renal trials that came out of, of uh, especially the GLP-1 and the, and the SGLT-2 studies. Um, so, I mean, in the terms of the GLP-1 is an agonist, the, 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 the key study was the leader trial, which found that, that patients with, with diabetes and, they, um, and established a cardiovascular disease actually had cardiovascular benefit. Um, in terms of the, the, the heart failure trials, things like DAPA-HF, yeah. on the CKD, things like empa also found that, that these were had um, uh, other benefits other than just glucose lowering. In fact, the glucose lowering may not be that significant, but these effects on on the on the heart failure on the CKD were were 
above what was expected of that than the, the glucose lowering. So there are different mechanisms by which um, these uh, other benefits occur. And, and I think that's why um, now, now we're treating diabetes. We don't just treat blood sugar. We're treating the whole patient because yeah. um, these patients have cardiovascular disease, uh, 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 CKD, um, and, and we want to treat the patient as a whole as opposed to just lowering the blood sugar. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yep, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, I just was going to go through the, the next Yeah, yeah, slide. yeah. I think, I think that would be helpful. <laughs> Which is, if, let's say they don't have any of this um, CVD or CKD or heart failure, then again, it's those um, different factors looking at hypoglycemia, weight, and cost, and also the, the degree of, um, of hyperglycemia looking at the A1C, whether it's above target or not. Okay. Um, but in general, um, it's, a, it's just, again, back to the, the, the that slide where I had so many boxes to explain how do you choose how agents. It has to yep. be individualized based on the patient's profile, um, the cost uh, preference, and, and the glucose storing effect, and things like uh, hypoglycemia and weight. Understand. Okay, sure. Maybe you could just take us through then about uh, insulin initiation, then we'll talk about the OH, the oral agents later on. Okay. Yeah, so I guess the questions that people often face is, so we've kind of talked about um, when to start. You've mentioned some of the indications that will be helpful. Yeah. Um, but I think people struggle with how to start, um, with what to start, and um, what kind of uh, regimen, whether you do a basal oral, basal bolus, or using uh, mixed insulin. So, um, okay. I, so I guess to understand you, this, yeah. <laughs> before you move on, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I think I think before you start insulin, you also want to, to decide whether does this patient need insulin or can you can you use other agents, for example, a GLP one, mm. which will help with uh, cardiovascular and also things like weight management as well. Yeah. Um, that is also because a GLP one uh, agonist is also an injectable, which is once a day for yeah. um, liver glutide, mm. um, or dulaglutide is actually once a week. So okay. if the patient agrees to a to an injectable, that is still one option. Is actually whether they'll be uh, whether they'll be okay to try a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which has all those other benefits other than, uh, other than uh, glucose lowering, uh, which ins insulin would be, the, would be the one. Yeah. I understand. Okay, thank you. Yep, so maybe we can then dive into the insulin bit right now. Okay, yes. Yeah. So this is another busy chart from the same, from the same place from the previous table. Um, we'll just skip to the next, the next slide. Okay. Yeah. I think... Uh, this is probably the, the very basic on, on how to initiate basal insulin. Yep. Um, so I extrapolated some information from the, from the previous slide into, into this slide. Um, in general, how we usually start basal insulin, um, so this is, this is used as an add-on to whatever regimen this patient is already on for glycemic control. So for example, let's say this patient is already on um, three oral agents with, with uh, suboptimal control. And, and we are adding on a uh, new basal insulin. So this will be on, on top of, of all of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in general, when we start basal insulin, um, the basal options would be uh, insulin glycine in the form of Ventus or, or insulin betamir or NTH uh, twice a day. Okay. Um, we usually start at a, at a unit of 0.1 to 0.2 uh, kg per body weight or in general about 10 units per day. Mm. Um, so... Any questions here so far? Uh, no, so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then I would, I would actually increase the, the basal insulin by about two units each time. Um, every, every three to five days um, uh, or as, as much as the patient feels comfortable to, to adjust it upwards until okay. a certain level, whether the fasting is at, at target or not. We'll okay. talk about, about targets later on as well. Yep. Um, but if let's say uh, the patient is already at a fasting target or already is at a level of 0.5 units per kg body weight. So what I mean by this is, for example, if a patient is uh, 70 kilograms, um, the basal of a 35, so 35 divided by 70 would be about 0 0.5, would already be uh, a very high level of basal insulin. And if the control is still not adequately controlled with this level of basal insulin, then that would mean that this patient probably would require some prandial coverage as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you decide between like the glycine datamir or NPH usually? Yeah, I, I in general, um, usually we use glycine because it's, it's, it's mostly once a day, uh, whereas datamir and NPH, uh, we might use it as BD. Okay. Um, uh, datamir, although it was previously um, also a, a long-acting insulin that can be 
also administered O M or O N, um, it may not have the full full twenty four hour day coverage that Grajin or or Tojo uh, may have. Um, in partly it was also due to cost. Um, so if let's say someone has a lot of cost concerns, then I may choose uh, NPH DD. Okay. And if let's say they require to mix insulin with with um, Actrapid and NPH, then that would be also easier if they they are required to mix the insulins on their own. I see. They need a lot of adjustments uh, for any reason or other. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess the other question, because what is suggested here is that um, normally for type 2s, you can go about with um, initiating a basal first on top of the ovo regimen, and then uh, only when they don't um, respond to HbA1c targets, then you sort of like add on a uh, basal, sorry, a um, bolus component or a prandial component to the insulin. Um, I'm just wondering in, let's say, instances where patients are, let's say the HbA1c control is quite bad, and you also mentioned this concept of glucotoxicity. Because um, I, I, I've seen sometimes in some patients that say they come in with the HbA1c of like 10, 11, and then when you monitor their inpatient glucose, even when you start them on a basal regimen, every time you, let's say, give the glipizide for the prandial component, it doesn't seem to budge very much with it. So um, are there instances where upfront you would um, give a basal bolus or a premix regimen rather than sort of saying, I'll trial basal first, and then if the A1C doesn't reach target, then I start a prandial insulin? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think if the glucose excursion remains very high, despite, despite max doses of of, of I say sulfonyl ureas, mm. um, then definitely uh, even inpatient you can you can just change them to 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 uh, uh, any insulin regimen that that contains a prandial cover. Um, so I think inpatient you actually have the benefit of being able to to monitor carefully and and being able to uh, up titrate um, fairly quickly, mm. uh, as opposed to an outpatient setting where where it's a more slow and more gentle um, titration. Um, okay. If in general, if let's say there's severe hyperglycemia, so if the blood sugars are persistently more than, than uh, 14 or 15, despite uh, maximum orals, together with, uh, with a fairly high dose of basal, let's say a, high, a basal of 0.5, then I would actually already switch to, to something with a prandial component. Okay, I understand. Um, okay, so I guess to answer the questions of what agents and stuff, we probably need to go through the next few slides to understand the basic <laughs> principles of the types of insulin first. Oh yeah, I mean, back, back to the previous slide, sorry. Sure. sorry. Yep. Yeah. No worries. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of adding on the basal, um, uh, sorry, adding on Prendel, um, I think um, premix tends to be quite popular because it is more convenient and has yep. also has fewer injections. But personally, I, I prefer a basal bolus or basal plus regimen because it's, it's just more flexible, mm. especially with people's um, uh, lifestyles and even yep. though it's more injections, it's more adjustable for them. I think uh, um, someone who would benefit from a premix would be someone who has a very uh, fixed lifestyle, sure. uh, fixed meal pattern, and fixed daily activities, and really values uh, the convenience of and of fewer injections. Yeah. Okay. Understand. Thank you. Okay, maybe you can talk about the different types of insulin. <laughs> I think I, I guess everybody watching this should, should roughly yep. roughly know. Um, uh, so rapid acting, we have our uh, short, uh, rapid acting analogs, um, Lispro, Aspa, and Zulitin. Um, I mean Himalog, Novo Rapid, and and Epidra, for, uh, is the the brand names. Um, and the other regular insulin is is also it's not rapid, but it's short acting. Um, in, in general, um. If patients can, it also depends on, on the meals that they eat and whether they, they snack throughout the day. So it really depends on, on, on their meal patterns as well. But in general, we will advise most patients to go on, on rapid acting if they, if, they can, if they can afford it on any, and if it, fits their, if it fits their lifestyle. Okay. In terms of the cost, just for out of curiosity, the cost differential for um, the rapid versus the short acting, is it very, very significant? Like rapid versus, let's say, novo rapid? Uh, I can't pull out my head right now, but sure. I think okay, the F rapid comes in about of of uh, a thousand units. Okay. Um, and I think the cost is roughly about uh eight or eight or nine dollars for the okay. bar. I see. Um, whereas uh, whereas S part, I think it, it comes in it comes in the in a in a ten of three hundred units, and each ten is about um, also about about eight 
eight or nine dollars, I think. So okay. it's probably so be it's about, about ten about times ish. Three yeah. times. Three, okay, three, three times. times. Three times the price. Okay, understand. Okay. Um, I think you are trying to highlight the resources available <laughs> for. Yes. Yes. So I mean, um, uh, those those in any which we we actually can access um some of the resources that are available on the yep. clinical matters at the ABCs of diabetes and endocrinology in our intranet. Um, and in terms of, I mean, right at, right at the bottom, where it says guide to, to medications available at any age, there's a guide to insulins, guide to oral agents, and also um, some advisory on SLT2 inhibitors now. Yep. Yeah. So okay. it looks basically like uh, the next slide. Um, yep. It will have a table with showing, and you can use this in terms of when you counsel your patients as well. Um, okay. how a valve looks like, how the pen looks like, um, and it gives you the different action profiles as well. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to talk about the oral agents here, or is there a slide later on that uh, uh, details? Yeah, slide later on. <laughs> okay, sure. Then maybe we'll talk about it later on. Yeah. Okay, um, so I guess the next question is, um, how should we go about adjusting uh, the insulin regimen based on the um, either self-monitoring uh, blood glucose level, or if they're inpatient, then the BGM monitoring that we do inpatient. Because I think sometimes people just like anyhow adjust. So like which values should we be adjusting, uh, let's say the, the night dose or the uh, morning dose, and how, what are some of the principles guiding that? Okay. So I mean, I prepared this um, for, for, for outpatient. Uh, I sure, think okay. no inpatient, worries. that's going to be another different type, yep. especially if patients okay. are, are sure. ill or critically ill. Yep. Um, okay. So, I mean, back to, to glycemic targets, it really depends on, on a few factors. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, things like um, the risk of um, adverse drug effects, things like hypoglycemia, um, someone who's had uh, very long-standing diabetes or short life expectancy or has a lot of comorbidities already. Um, and then we will actually don't want such a tight glycemic target. Yeah. So, patients we want a very tight glycemic target would be those who, let's say, are newly diagnosed diabetes, young, uh, a young patient with uh, no, no existing comorbidities, no vascular complications, um, or even patients who are very motivated or who, who especially for young ladies who, who are planning for pregnancy, then you want a very, very tight glycemic target. On so the other hand, like less than 6.5 kind of target. Yeah, less than 6.5. Okay. Yeah. okay, yep. Um, and tighter also is possible, as long as okay. they don't experience hypoglycemia. It's just a matter of, of a, a balance. Like you, you want it to be tighter, yet you don't want patients to experience hypoglycemia as well. Understand. Um, on the other hand, if, if let's say you have a, an older patient um, who's had um, diabetes for 30 or 40 years and um, has multiple uh, comorbidities, for example, ischemic heart disease or, or CKD or NSAID renal failure, etc., um, then not only is there more harm if you try to aim for a very tight control, um, but the, the expected benefit because of the short life expectancy or also because there's already established complications. So the benefit of tight glycemic control is, is not so good. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a ballpark way of sort of like, because I know some people say like, let's say, um, you, if let's say older patients, you can use like the age kind of thing to give you a ballpark A1C target. How, how do you normally go about um, coming up with like targets for these patients? Because I guess it sounds quite variable. Yeah, uh, in general, I would say A1C is, uh, my, my, my usual figure is A1C of 7%. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then if, if let's say they're young, yep. uh, planning, as I mentioned, then I would aim for 6.5. So I'll put yep. that in my notes, I'll aim for a 6.5 target. Okay. And the patient also knows that A1C target as well. Yep. Um, for, for older in, individuals, um, then um, 7.5 or 8 would be okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess next we talk about the different, um, let's say, uh, yeah, self-monitoring targets. Yeah, so different, different groups also recommend different um, glycemic targets. Um, but in general, this is roughly what I, I, I use. Um, so I'll usually target the fasting blood sugar to be between four to eight, um, mm -hmm. sometimes four to seven. Mm -hmm. um, but if they are, if let's say they, they are prone to hypoglycemia or I don't want it to drop the A1C too fast, um, then I'll aim for a higher, a, a looser glycemic target, for example, six to eight. Okay. And this is using the insulin, uh, the basal insulin. Mm -hmm. um, thereafter, depending on, um, if let's say the patient requires um, Prandil insulin, 
or um, or let's say it's on oral agents that that are trying to target the, the prandial insulin as one, and if, let's say the glycemic exclusions are very high. So I'll, in general, I'll try to to aim for less than ten first, and for a tighter uh, tighter regimen, I'll aim for less than eight pre meals. Understand. Yeah, and, and everything just avoid hypoglycemia. That would be uh, the also another big takeaway. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, Ken. This is for yep. that's for uh, outpatient. Okay, not understand. For inpatient. <laughs> yeah, caveat, caveat. Okay, understand. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um. So next, we yeah want to find out a bit more because uh, many of our patients with diabetes have concomitant uh, renal impairments. Um. So we we know that uh, I mean number one diabetes uh causes um diabetic kidney disease, and I guess number two also, a lot of the medications um, have, uh, have to be considered in terms of how we dose it, whether or not it's contraindicated or not when there's concomitant renal impairment. So maybe uh, you could highlight some of these things that um, we should be taking note of when we manage our patients with DM. Okay, yeah. So uh, I mean, just, just wanted to highlight that, that nowadays the, the term OHGAs is not favoured anymore um, okay. because not all all agents actually cause hypoglycemia. Yep. So now they've already changed the terminology to, I think the more favorite terminology is oral glucose-storing drugs or okay. agents or oral anti-diabetic medications or oral anti hypoglycemic agents, for example. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so, yeah. so this is a, another uh, ACG from, from, from uh, our ministry a few years ago. Yep. Uh, although it's a little bit out outdated already <laughs> because of the new evidence. Um, but I, I thought actually this was a very simple, uh, quick way to look through all the medications that, that we can go through. Okay. Yeah. So, um, also over here, we, we have the different classes of, of medications. Uh, metformin, sulfonylureas, SGLT2, dpp 4 spiclitinides, PZDs, and, and, and uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Um, I think one thing to highlight is... Um, so in particular for our renal patients, um, there are there, there, I mean, there are different considerations. So um, in terms of whether you can use a certain drug or not, um, so metformin, you would not recommend if the EGFR is less than 30, same for SLT2s. Um, and you can use uh, things like sulfonylureas or meglisonides, but, but they will be at high risk of hypoglycemia. Um, PZDs in general, I'll try to avoid because of the risk of of fluid retention and probably there are also better agents to use as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, so anything else general, you want me to say about this? Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to ask a quick question in terms of, I think we definitely see the first four classes used a lot more commonly. Yeah. Um, in terms of the meglatonides, tazolidin, uh, dions, as well as the um, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, um, are there instances where we still tend to use them? Um, okay, so meglisonides, um, I, I've used them for as an alternative to sulfonylurea for some patients who has um, G6PD deficiency. Okay. Um, so I've used that before. Um, in general, uh, the other benefit of meglisonides is, is also a quick, uh, quick on and quick off kind of action okay. rather than sulfonylurea, which might actually have a risk of of uh, in uh, meals uh, uh, hypoglycemia in between meals. I see. Okay. Um, in terms of TZDs, uh, I still don't use it that often. Um, I've used it for certain cases which are are um, insulin very insulin resistant, um, yet have a lot of uh, yet weight may not be a, such an issue because it can it can actually cause weight gain. Yep. Um, so yeah, in general, I don't use it very often. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Um, for the cost, I think um, it, it doesn't bring down the A1C that much and also has other side effects. Uh, but yes, you can still use them, especially if patients uh, have very high um, post-prandial uh, uh, glucose excursions, just to reduce the glucose excursions a little bit is also, so, so you also can use it that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so then we can move on to maybe some of the specific agents. Yeah, um, I think just in general, I mean, this year was in 2017. What I wanted to, to show is just the, the adjustments um, in, in, the, in, the, in the medications with the, with the creatine clearance. So, okay. um, so this was back in 2017. So since then, there's new updates from the manufacturer label. DAPA, you can actually use um, 10 milligrams, even if the EGFR is more than 45. Mm. Between 30 to 45, um, I think increasingly we also see, and I myself have been using it as off-label use, as low yep. dose. Now. 
so at 100 uh, uh, mg for kana or 5 mg for dapa or 10 mg for for empa as well especially okay. if they have significant uh, proteinuria i see but i wouldn't okay. necessarily want to to recommend it for initiation um, so i would say if you start this you need to be really careful uh, monitor the kidney function and make sure you're not causing additional harm to the patient. Okay, understand. Uh, and for the DPP-4s? Uh, DPP-4s, I think we're most familiar with uh, linagliptin and citagliptin, maybe maybe vilagliptin. Um, but for linagliptin, um, there's, there's no dose adjustment required. For citagliptin, we'll have to reduce the, reduce the dose. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so this is another busy slide. I apologize for that. I <laughs> didn't make it very, very nice. It's just text. Um, for the inpatients with renal impairment, for the oral agents, um, one by one again. So for metformin, um, I would avoid if the EGFR is less than 30 as risk of lactic acidosis. For sulfonylureas, um, the patients with renal impairment would be at high risk of, of hypoglycemia. So I would advise patients to, to monitor and also to advise them how to monitor for hypoglycemia. Um, we don't use food bancomite anymore very much in the hospital, but I think it's still available and in, in, in it's still used by some of our patients as well. Yep. I, I would avoid this in, in patients with renal impairment. Mm. So SGLT2s, I think we, we spent some time earlier to talk about it. Um, it can actually be used for patients. You might actually want to select SGLT2 in patients who already have CKD or abdominuria because that actually reduces the, the progression. Um, on the other hand, it's almost like a double-edged sword. Um, as, as there's worsening kidney function, um, the glucose lowering effect will not be so effective because, um, I mean, that's just a mechanism of action that you need the kidneys to be functioning for it to actually work. Also, together with the risk of, of uh, dehydration and worsening of kidney function, you just need to be really cautious with it, especially if you are if you're initiati initiating it with someone who has uh, compromised renal function already. Okay. And for DPP-4s, uh, generally well tolerated. So, uh, you need to adjust the, 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 the dose. The negative you can keep it as five milligrams. Uh, for a carbos, um, I think it's not recommended based on this. The, the labeling on the, okay. the manufacturer labeling, so I also wouldn't use it. Mm. And uh, TZDs, um, I would also generally avoid it unless there's a very good reason to. Okay. Yeah. In terms of insulin spice. Uh, for insulin, um, yeah, I would, because because of the risk of hypoglycemia again, so I'll be very cautious when I start someone on insulin. I'll start low and go slow. Okay. That would be my general advice for, for initiating insulin. So, especially in those cases, I would start a basal first before I, I do a, a add a prender component either through basal bolus or premix. Okay, understand. Thank you. Um, yep, so you also had a word on the glycemic targets in CKD. Yeah, so, um, so in terms of glycemic targets, um, again, it needs to be individualized. Uh, the, the problem with, with HbA1c and CKD, um, as mentioned, it can, be, it can be increased or decreased. So you want to use the A1c in combination with the with the self monitoring of blood glucose, when okay. you adjust make adjustments for for um, whatever oral agents or or insulins, okay. And I then understand. other considerations actually, um, so as mentioned, uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, if the patient is NSH, uh, already has NSH renal failure, uh, are they on what kind of regimen are they on? Are they on PD or HG? Um, because uh, lifestyle is completely different once someone is on on has NSH renal failure. So things like the meal times at the appetite and also for the PD regimen, it's really important to have uh, a good glycemic control because that will also affect the, 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 the UF for, for our patients. And lastly, you know, our patients with, with renal impairment, if they're already on PD and HD, um, there's already a significant burden, healthcare burden that they feel going for, for hemodialysis or performing peritone dialysis. So at cutting down uh, pills or cutting down injections, Whatever necessary may actually help them instead of, of, of adding instead of adding them would give um, more more burden to them. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the very comprehensive uh, approach and considerations that we should take note of uh, for um, DM management in patients with CKD. Um, okay, so I think we are approaching our last couple of questions. Um, so in terms of long term follow up, because um, many patients with DM are followed up not just by endocrinologists, but by the family medicine physicians, by generalists as well. Um, so maybe you could just take us through um, what are the important things to take note of when we follow up with these patients, uh, as well as, I think HbA1c targets you kind of already went through earlier on. Yeah. Um, so maybe also just what are some of the end organ complications screening, make sure um, in terms of like timings and things like that. Okay, yeah. 
So I've gone through this. Yep. Um, so I'll move on to the next one. Next one. Uh, yeah. So I think um, the screening. Um, I I think our our co colleagues in in the in primary care actually do the load of this um, screening. Actually, it's an annual foot screen. Yep. Um, sort of uh, annual depth, uh, retinal photo and also ret uh, uh, at least an annual uh, albuminuria, let's say, if it's not known to have, have albuminuria in the first place. So, I mean, in terms of the foot screening, things like foot deformities, any wounds, uh, the pulses, sensation, and also the nail and foot care education, that we that will be part of the, the annual foot care uh, review, which we recommend once a year. Um, in terms of the retinal photo, um, I think Singapore has a very good uh, system to that does the uh, the the screening for 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 diabetic retinopathy. So um, uh, I think all the polyclinics and some and some uh, family uh, uh, med medicine clinics also have retinal photo that they are able to send to SNEC or other hospitals for for assessment. And if necessary, then there will be uh, a need to refer to ophthalmology. Um, in terms of renal function, I think as part of our routine follow up, we usually check a, a renal panel or creatinine anyway, um, and uh, albuminuria as well uh, through a um, urine albumin and creatinine ratio as part of the screening. Okay, thank you. Um, yep, so I guess this would be um, specifically the DM care um, considerations for older patients. Is there anything in particular that we should be mindful of? Oh yes, so um, and this was, was in uh, together with with the A1C targets, which I want to wanted to yep. highlight. Um, I guess this is more of a, a guidance uh, from a proper institution like ADA yep. <laughs> rather than my own ballpark figure. Yep. Um, so so in, in terms of the, so for example, for the last section where it says very po complex of poor health and stage chronic uh, illnesses. So the star star, according to the, the, the actual uh, paper actually showed that you know, if they have stage four congestive heart failure, if they say they have end stage lung disease or uncontrolled metastatic cancers, um, and they have also significant impairments in their uh, ADLs, and together with the, the, the limited life expectancy, um, then A1C of less than 8.5 and the, and the glycemic targets of a fasting glucose of or even 5.6 5. to 10 would be, would be acceptable. Okay. Um, mm. In patients who, who maybe are not so complex or poor health, then a A1C target of less than uh, 8.0 is also acceptable as well. So in the second, in the second, um, second rule. Okay. So the focus for these patients generally would be to avoid hypos and at the same time also just avoid um, like crisis of very high levels of sugars. Lah. Yeah. In fact, I mean, the Diabetes UK uh, end of life diabetes care recommendations, um, the glycemic targets are, are also quite liberal mm. from 6 to, to 15. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that perspective. Okay, so I think we've covered quite a lot today. Uh, and um, yeah, I think for some of the other more uh, specific things, like in, uh, let's say, NBM management or uh, inpatient glycemic targets and crisis management, I guess the more inpatient aspect of things um, probably be more appropriate to cover it in another future session. Uh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's been so, a long talk. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, it's been really helpful. Um, but maybe are there any um, key take home points that, let's say, listeners, um, that you would want to highlight to listeners? Yeah, okay. Um, so I think firstly would be that the glycemic target should be individualized, which I think I've highlighted a number of times over the, the whole talk. Um, second thing was actually to, to um, I think just the basics on, on insulin uh, initiation and, and titration, and also the different factors that we, we take into consideration when choosing uh, the pharmacological uh, therapies for our patients with, with diabetes. Okay. So I think that would be the take-home points. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mendes.